To my YouTube listeners, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please subscribe. It'll make a big difference for the Hasidic Story Project. This is the Hasidic Story Project with Barack Holman, podcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you. To become a supporter of this podcast, please go to HasidicStory.com. H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. Since he was a young man, Velvel had worked as a cattle dealer. Now, in those days, there were no cars, so animals were the form of transportation, and they were used as machinery as well, for example, for plowing fields and for carrying large loads. So being a cattle dealer was kind of like selling luxury cars today. And he was very successful. He'd been doing it for many years. And one day, Velvel came to Chernovitz with a large amount of money that he had saved up and even borrowed in order to make an important trade. And Bo Hashem, it worked out very well for him, and he made a profit of 1,500 rubles, which was a fortune at the time. And he was feeling very good about himself, and he was thinking about all the future money that he could make with this money, and how happy his wife would be when he came back home with all the money. And on his way out of town, he passes through the marketplace, and he sees a very holy-looking Jew walking around, collecting tzedakah. Tees kule mitzvahs! Tzedakah! Tzedakah! Velvel he goes over to somebody and he says, who is that saintly person that's walking around the marketplace collecting money? He'd never seen anyone look so spiritual and holy, so in this world and not in this world at the same time. He just couldn't wrap his mind around who this person was. And the more he looked at the man who's collecting the tzedakah, the more Velvel's heart started to beat faster. He immediately felt a connection with this person. So he says to one of the guys in the market, Who is that? Who is that guy? And the merchant says, That's Reb Chaim. He's a tzaddik. He's a righteous person. And he's also our Rebbe. He's the Rebbe of everyone here in Chernovitz. And they said, You see him now? You should see him on Shabbos. Velva says, Why? What happens to him on Shabbos? And the merchant said, On Shabbos? He's a head taller. On Shabbos, Reb Chaim isn't even in this world. And Velva says, What do you mean? What do you mean a head taller? What do you mean he's not in this world? Everyone's in this world. In the vendor in the market, he said, Reb Chaim is always thinking about Shabbos. During the week, he writes about Shabbos. And on Shabbos, he lives Shabbos. And you see him walking around the marketplace collecting tzedakah. When he hears that there's somebody who's in debtor's prison, who couldn't pay off their debts, and was thrown into jail because of that, he walks around all week collecting penny by penny in order to free them from their debt. And so Velvel, the cattleman, is watching the old tzaddik approach people, saying, Tis kula mitzvahs! Tzedakah for people who got into debt and can't get out! Tzedakah for poor brides! Tzedakah lekovid Shabbos kodesh! And Velvel's watching Reb Chaim walk around. And again, he feels his heart beating more and more. And he goes over to Reb Chaim and says to him, Shalom Aleichem! And Reb Chaim stops collecting for a second. He turns and looks at Velvel, who's dressed in a beautiful suit, with a beautiful hat, looking like a wealthy man, because he was, or at least had the appearance of a wealthy man. And Velvel says to Reb Chaim, I heard you're collecting tzedakah for people in debtor's prison. And Reb Chaim says, yes, that's right. Do you want to give some tzedakah? Do you want to help out? And Velvel, the cattleman, he says, tell me, how much money do you need? And the old tzaddik, he looks deep into Velvel's eyes. And he says, 1,500 rubles. And Velvel says to him, and how much do you have now? And he says, Oh Hashem, I've collected a ruble and a half. Velvel was about to burst out laughing. A ruble and a half? But you need to collect 1,500. You have quite a bit more to go. And Reb Chaim says, no, what are you going to do? When Hashem is ready to send me the money, I'll get all the money. But for now, it's simply my job to do my hishtadlus. Make my effort to collect the money. The rest is up to Hashem. It's not my problem. It's Hashem's problem. So Velva was very impressed with Reb Chaim. And he happened to have 1,500 rubles in his pocket. Although the money was a profit and also to pay back the money that he had loaned and the money that he invested. And he looks at Reb Chaim and he says to him, Listen, Chaim, if I give you all the money you need to ransom those people, 
what can you give me in exchange? And now when Reb Chaim was going around and collecting the pennies from the people in the market, no matter how much anyone gave him, he would bless them and pour blessings on them. A person would give him a penny and Reb Chaim would say, tell me, my sweetest friend, what do you need? And this poor Jew would say, Reb Chaim, my wife and I need money to buy food for our children. And Reb Chaim would bless him, say Hashem should send you all the parnasa, all the livelihood you need, so that you can sit and learn Torah, serve Hashem b'simcha with joy, without any worries whatsoever. And the poor Jew would shout out, Amen! The next person would give Reb Chaim a penny. And Reb Chaim would say, What do you need, my sweetest friend? What can I help you with? This woman would say, Reb Chaim, my husband and I have been married for many years, and we still haven't married to have children. Do you think in the merit of the penny that I gave you now for tzedakah, you can bless us to please have children? Reb Chaim said, yes, Hashem, please open the gates of heaven for this woman and her husband in the merit of the penny that they gave to tzedakah to save Jews that are in debtor's prison and to give to poor brides. And the woman would shout, Amen. So Velvo had been watching this all along. He didn't give a penny. He gave a thousand five hundred rubles, an absolute fortune. And so he says to Reb Chaim, so tell me, Chaim, if I give you all this money, what can you give me in return? And Reb Chaim has a very serious look on his face. And he says, any blessing that you ask for, my sweetest friend, you tell me what you want, and I will bless you. And Bezat Hashem, you will have it. And so Velvel, the cattleman, the businessman, he looks at the old holy tzaddik, and his mind is racing. What should he ask for? He can ask for money. He'd be richer than anyone in the world. He could ask for health. He'd live forever. He could ask for shalom bayit and have a house where light is coming out of it. He could ask for Torah learning, become a great scholar. He could ask and ask and ask, and he didn't know what to ask for. But then he remembered what the merchants in the marketplace said about Reb Chaim, that on Shabbos, he's one head higher. And he thought to himself, wow, the Shabbos that Reb Chaim experiences must be out of this world. So he says to Reb Chaim, here's the money. And he takes out 1,500 rubles from his pocket and hands it to the tzaddik. Reb Chaim takes it and he says to him, please tell me what you want me to bless you with. And I will bless you like nobody's ever blessed you before. And Velva says, Reb Chaim, I gave this a lot of thought and I want to experience Shabbos like you. Reb Chaim's eyes opened wide. And he said, I'm sorry, my sweetest friend. I can bless you with many things, but I don't think I can bless you with that. You don't know what you're asking for to experience Shabbos like me. But Velvo said, listen, I'm a businessman, and we just made a business deal. And when money switches hands, I trust that you're going to fulfill your side of the bargain. Now you said to me, you give me the money, and I'll bless you with whatever you want. And I gave it a lot of thought. I don't want wealth, and I'm not asking for anything else. I want to experience Shabbos like you. Now don't hold back, Reb Chaim. A deal is a deal. So Reb Chaim says again, I don't think you know what you're asking for. I think you should think again, because once I bless you, there's no taking it back. But the cattle dealer, he said, a deal is a deal. Reb Chaim said, okay, you asked for it. May Hashem bless you, that you have Shabbosim, Shabbases, like me. And Velvel shouted, Amen! And Reb Chaim said to him, but now that I blessed you, you are going to experience Shabbases like you've never experienced in your whole life. And let me warn you, never ever, ever be on the road from Thursday night on because you will be stuck in the woods. You will not be able to travel from Thursday night on. You have to be wherever you're planning on being for Shabbos and almost completely ready for Shabbos by Thursday night. Or forget it. You're not going anywhere. So Reb Chaim says, May Hashem rested on Shabbos from creating the world and raise the holy Shabbos into the highest places of holiness Grant you a share in the Holy Shabbos, the way I merit to experience it. And Velvo again shouted, Amen. They shook hands and parted ways. And Velvo comes back home, and his wife was very happy to see him, because she was sure that he was successful in the business deal, and they had a lot of debts, and she needed to pay them off. She said to her husband, Where's the money? And he says, Oh, I bought something with it on the way home. She said, Oh, okay. What did you buy? It must have been something really special. He said, Oh, it is. She said, well, can I see it? He said, no, it's not something you can see. She said, what do you mean? He said, you'll see. She said to him, what do we do about our debts? He said, Bezat Hashem. Hashem will take care of the debts. And so the wife, being much more disciplined than I would ever be, didn't say a word to her husband. It came Thursday night. 
And as Velvel is sleeping, explosions began to happen in his brain. He couldn't sleep. He's rolling around in bed. His mind is opening, bursting, exploding. He wondered whether he was going crazy. He'd never experienced anything like this. And everything that happened around him took on more meaning and had newer depth. He was able to see things like he'd never seen before and understand the world in ways he'd never understood before. And come Friday morning, he was flying. It was as if he was already in Shabbos. He went to the mikvah Friday morning. And every time he dunked down in the mikvah, he understood a deeper and deeper meaning of Shabbos in the world and creation. He came back and saw his wife's cooking and he kissed his wife and he kissed the chalas and he kissed the wine and he kissed the candles and he kissed his children and he was practically doing somersaults in the house. So excited that Shabbos was coming. His wife says to him, Velva, what's with you? He says, you remember I told you I bought something with the money? She said, yeah, I still don't know what you bought with it, but we still have a lot of debts. He said, I bought Shabbos. I gave the money to a tzaddik and asked him to bless me with Shabbos. And I'm seeing Shabbos like I've never experienced in my life before. The wife was a little suspicious of Velvel. She's like, Velvel, you know, get over yourself. And Velvel goes to shul. He's looking around the shul and he's thinking, no one here is really davening. Everybody's just mumbling the davening. Blah, 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 blah. He's like, what kind of davening is this? And they said to him, what do you mean, Velvel? What kind of davening is this? Let me lead the davening. So they say, okay, you're welcome to lead the davening. He gets up, he starts the davening. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos, good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. Everyone's shocked. They didn't even know that Velvo could sing. He's leading the davening from a place that nobody even understood where it was coming from. Because everybody in the shul was being carried away by Velvo's Kabbalah Shabbat. The more he sang, the more people got into it. And it took them two hours, when normally the davening would take 15, 20 minutes. They're dancing and singing and banging on the tables. The walls of the shul were shaking. No one had ever experienced a Shabbos like that before. The whole congregation was uplifted and flying from Velvel's Kabbalah Shabbat. And then he came home, and he was bursting with joy. And he'd never experienced Shabbos like this. And the first thing his wife says is, Velvel, why are you so late? And he says, because it's Shabbos. She's like, well, Velvel, come on, we're hungry, make Kiddush. So first he looks at the words in the sitter, and he looks at the cup of wine, and he looks at his wife and his children, and he starts saying the words of the Kiddush, and it takes him two hours to finish the Kiddush. But he was on such a high level that instead of being angry at him, his family was completely caught up in the holiness and the bliss of Shabbos with Velvel. And when they finally drank the wine that Velvel had blessed, they had never drinking wine like that in their entire lives. That night, Velvel couldn't sleep for one second. The whole universe was expanding and contracting. In his mind, there were fireworks going off. He was with the Shekhinah, he was with the Divine Presence. He could feel it. It was as if he was in the Holy of the Holies in the Beit Mikdash and the Holy City of Jerusalem in ancient times. Next morning, he got up, he went to the mikveh. He went to shul, and the same thing with the davening. And when he heard the Torah read, the words of the Torah danced before his eyes. And every word had such deep meaning. It went so deep into his heart and his brain. His mind was literally blown by Shabbos. When he came back from Mincha in the third meal, which is called Raiva Deravin, the Holy of the Holy. You know, the third meal on Shabbos is like the Ne'ila, like the fifth prayer that we say on Yom Kippur. It's such a high place. And Velva was just out of control. He couldn't sit down, couldn't concentrate. He couldn't handle all of the Kedusha and joy that was coming down to him. He had this longing to do exactly what Hashem wanted during all of his days and seconds here on earth that gripped him all the way to his bones. When he made Havdalah and he looked at the flames on the braided candle, he understood the perfection of the contradiction of being holy in this mundane world. 
And finally he drank the wine from Havdalah, and Shabbos was over. And Velvel says to his wife, my sweetest wife, thank you for being so patient with me. I'm completely exhausted from Shabbos, and I have to go to sleep. And Velvel slept for an entire day. He woke up Sunday afternoon, realizing the time, quickly put on his tefillin and davened. And once again, everything was normal. He didn't feel this excitement anymore. It calmed down. It took him a few days to recover. But before he knew it, it was Wednesday, and he was reading in the Siddur at the end of Hayom, Yom Revi'i. Today is Wednesday. He says, Hayom Yom Revi'i B'Shabbos. Today is the fourth day of the week, of the week that we're getting ready for Shabbos. And at the end it says, L'chul which is the first prayer you say in the Friday night davening. And he couldn't concentrate on anything. And by the time Thursday night came, forget about it. Once again, Shabbos, his mind is blown. All week long he's thinking about Shabbos. His wife says to him, what's going to be? And he says, I'm sorry, my sweetest wife. I can't go back to selling cattle anymore. I have to live Shabbos. And he said, I guess I'm going to have to do what my Rebbe did, Reb Chaim. And the next day, he takes a little sack and starts walking around the marketplace, collecting tzedakah to free Jews from debtor's prison and to collect for poor brides. And each person that would give him a penny, Velva would bless them back. And after many years, after Reb Chaim had passed away, Reb Velvel was known as the tzaddik of his town. And one day there was a cattle dealer that came to the marketplace. And he says, who's that guy collecting tzedakah? He's so holy. I've never seen anyone like him. And the merchant said, ah, oh, that's Reb Velvel. He's a tzaddik. He's a completely righteous man. And on Shabbos, you should see him. When he stands up, he stands a whole head higher. I have one more story for you, my sweetest friends. Once during his travels, the Holy Rebbe, Reb Aun of Karlin, arrived in the town of Zarovitz, close to the Holy Shabbos. And he saw there was a small cottage there on the edge of town. And he knocked on the door, seeing a mezuzah there, hoping to find a place to stay for Shabbos. And a small woman opens the door. And she listens to the request of the Rebbe to stay there for Shabbos. And she says, you're welcome to stay here. And my husband, he'll be home soon. And so he came into the house. And as soon as he stepped into the house, Reb Aaron of Karlin felt himself enveloped by a sense of kedusha of holiness. And he realized there's something unique about this house and the people living in it. So he went and prepared himself for Shabbos, went to the mikvah, changed his clothes, made all the preparations he needed, and he was about to go out the door to the synagogue when he meets Rabbi Yitzchak, the owner of the house, just coming back from working. He was dressed as a simple peasant with an axe. He was cutting wood didn't look any different from any other simple Jew. And he introduced himself to Reb Aaron as Yitzchak. He says, Shalom Aleichem. Welcome to my home. The Karlina Rebbe is trying to find what's so special about this guy because clearly there's something special going on in this house. And the Karlina Rebbe was used to screaming the davening and singing with a great deal of enthusiasm. However, Reb Yitzchak just quickly went through the davening, made Kiddush, sat down and ate a very simple meal. But even in the simple food, the Karlina Rebbe could feel there was something special going on. And even though he couldn't figure out where it was from, he knew it had to be from the husband and wife who were living in this house. But every time he looked at them, there was nothing special in anything they said or did. Nothing any different than any of the poor Jews he had met. And when Shabbos ended, Reb Aaron thanked his host and hostess and continued on his travels, not understanding exactly what he had experienced that Shabbos. And the next week... He's in the nearby town of Premishlan, learning in the Beit Midrash in the study hall. And this woman comes and she says that she needs somebody to come from the Hever Kadisha, the burial society. And she says, please come with me to Zarowitz now because my husband is dying. And he's asking that the Hever Kadisha be there in his last moments. So the guy gathered together the members of the Hever Kadisha and followed her to her home. But when they entered the home, the husband wasn't there. And they said, wait a minute, you said your husband is dying. Is this some kind of joke? You brought us all the way here for nothing? She said, no, of course, my honorable gentleman. I wouldn't have brought you here if this wasn't the real thing. I promise you, my husband is on his way and he'll be here shortly. And shortly after, the husband walked in the door, holding some wood and some straw. 
He put the wood down, laid the straw on the floor, and then lay down on his back on the straw, looking completely healthy and completely normal. He starts talking to the members of the Hevra Kadisha, of the burial society. He said, my sweetest friends, it's time for me now to leave this world. You see, I've lived a secret life as a hidden tzaddik, but now the time has come for me to reveal myself, because I'm about to die. I want you to quickly go to Premishlan and bring back as many scribes as you can. Have them bring quills and paper. In this box over here, and he showed them this special box, he said, I have my secret writings, and they'll be able, while I'm laying here on the ground, before I'm buried, to copy anything I have in this box. But the moment that you see a change in the color of my face, all writing has to stop immediately. At that point, Rabbi Yitzchak finished speaking. He closed his eyes, and it looked like his face was burning like a fire. And then his lips started moving in a silent prayer, and it looked like he had passed away. But his face was still red. So the scribes were brought, and they took the papers that were in the box of the tzaddik and started quickly writing down everything they could. The whole time the Hevra Kadisha is watching Reb Yitzchak's face, they see the color is still in his face. And then, after about half an hour, the color disappeared, it turned white, and the box, which had all of the holy writings, mysteriously closed by itself. All the scribes stopped writing, and they started getting ready to bury Reb Yitzchak. And when Reb Aaron of Karlin heard of the death of the hidden tzaddik, in this incredible story, he was filled with regret. Oh, what he could have learned from the tzaddik, what he missed out on. He knew he was in a holy home, but he wasn't on the level to merit to learn from the hidden tzaddik. And so he went to the burial and paid his respects to the widow. And he said to her, listen, I'm a Rebbe, and I could feel the kadusha, I could feel the holiness in your home, but I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And now that I heard about your husband in his secret life, is there something you can tell me? Can you maybe reveal to me one secret, something? And she said to him, I'm really sorry. There's nothing I can tell you. My husband made me take an oath that by being married to him, I wouldn't be allowed to reveal any of his secrets, not in this world and not in the world to come. And so Rabaron was bitterly disappointed, he comforted her like all of the mourners of Zion and turned to leave. And just as he reached the door, the widow called out to him and she said, wait, there's one small thing I can show you. Do you see those candlesticks there on the shelf? From the day I married my husband until the day he died, the candles that were lit in those candlesticks never burned out. They stayed lit all by themselves all the years that we were married. The Carlina Rebbe left the cottage deep in meditation, wondering about what the hidden Tzadi could have accomplished in the world and what secrets he had missed out on. Maybe secrets that could only have been told to Mashiach himself. And so you see, sometimes, my sweetest friends, we're in the presence of greatness. And we don't see it. So I want to bless you. And Bezat Hashem, you'll bless me back. That when we're in those pockets of holiness, we merit to see it and experience it and absorb it and let it raise us up. I na 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 ya la 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 I na 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 ya la 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 I na 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 ya la 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 ya la 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 I, I love
Thank you for listening, my sweetest friends. You know we're in the month of Elul now. We're getting ready for Tishrei, for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Simchat Torah, the holy, holy, holy days. I bless you all, Bezrat Hashem, that you'll be able to taste the sweetness, that the year will be so sweet, it will be sweet in your hearts and in your minds and in your mouth. Ktiva v'chatima tova l'shana tova umetuka should be written and sealed for a good and sweet new year. Thank you for listening. I look forward to our next story, Bezat Hashem. Zai gesund.